Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. and Barbuda's Electoral Commission questions the court's authority to decide on where Barbudans vote in upcoming general elections. That's our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Wednesday, March 7th. From the CMC News Centre in Bridgetown, I'm Nicole Best. Good evening. The Antigua and Barbuda Electoral Commission, ABEC, is challenging the authority of a judge to hear an application seeking to prevent it from having Barbudans vote on the mainland instead of in their constituencies in the upcoming general election. ABEC's attorneys made submissions to that effect on Tuesday as hearing began on the application filed by attorney Charlesworth Tabor on behalf of leader of the Barbuda People's Movement, Trevor Walker. Walker is challenging the legal basis on which ABEC decided that the that eligibility that that eligible voters registered for the constituency of Barbuda would be required to vote in Antigua because of the prevailing circumstances on the hurricane hit island. The injunction application was set to be heard on Tuesday, but moments before the hearing commenced, ABEC presented an application of its own. Attorney Patricia Simon Ford contended that before the hearing could proceed, it first had to be determined whether the court had any jurisdiction to hear the matter. ABEC's contention is that the court does not have the jurisdiction to hear the matter and that the application is premature. In its application, it says the parties should wait for the outcome of the elections to file any petition, not seeking an injunction before the polls even take place. Tabor accused ABEC attorney of trying to blindside as he and Walker were only provided with the commission's position just minutes before the hearing began. He said the matter was raised in court out of the blue and he was not served with any documents. Tabor was given until Wednesday afternoon to submit a response to ABEC's position and Justice Claire Henry has adjourned the matter to Thursday. The Grenada government is denying allegations that it forced a number of radio stations off the air for political reasons ahead of next week's general elections. Rumors had recently been circulating that Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell and the ruling New National Party, the NNP, were attempting to muzzle media houses they felt were opposed to the party in this heightened election season. But Dr. Mitchell dismissed the allegations as political gerrymandering. Last week, the National Telecommunications Regulatory Commission asked some stations to stop transmitting for a while while to facilitate a search for signals that were interfering with tower communication at the Morris Bishop International Airport. The probe revealed that two radio stations were broadcasting above their licensed wattage and causing interference at the airport. Denying his party's involvement in the matter, the Prime Minister said he would be a foolish politician to meddle with a media house weeks before the March 13 poll in which he is seeking another term in office. Meantime, the NNP says that despite opposition rhetoric, the ruling party has not lost political support. Prime Minister Mitchell told local media at his last press conference before the general election that two recent scientific surveys showed there was a strong mix between the genders, age and socio-economic groups in support for his party. I believe we, we have succeeded in getting the support of all classes in this country, majority. People, uh, when I speak, like I speak, I mean majority, yeah? because clearly in every group you have supporters of the opposition, and quite so, because we live in a democracy. So we say the classes. We see the the poor class of people in our country, the marginalized. We see them in their majority way behind our party. We see the middle class voters right there. And strange enough, probably the highest amount of upper middle class and above business type persons that I've ever seen in my political life support the NNP, it has been this campaign. 
we've seen we have not seen any hostility from religious groups in the country I couldn't say this about 2008 I could not say this if anything I would have said we saw a very clear strong opposition coming from religious groups Mitchell did not disclose who conducted the survey but said his party is not taking any voter for granted. Just over 78,000 people are eligible to cast ballots in the election, which is being contested by 45 candidates representing seven political parties in 15 constituencies. Police officers are expected to cast their ballots on Friday. Cuba's Electoral Commission has three more days to address concerns ahead of Sunday's parliamentary elections. On Sunday, the commission engaged in an exercise to test the system and identify any weaknesses. We get more in this report from Richards Richards of Carnal Carib TV in Cuba. Around 200,000 electoral authorities took part in this Sunday dynamic testing that allowed to corroborate the availability of means and election structures for the sake of guaranteeing the necessary conditions for the suffrage of next March the 11th. The previous working day to the elections where Cubans will elect the congressmen parliament as well as the delegates to the People's Power Provincial Assembles served to complete details on the informative support, data transmission, transporting means and communication. In the meantime, this week, the correction of the problems detected during the essay will be mended. With the help of the voting urns next Sunday, March the 11th, the Cubans will contribute to assure integrity and the future of its country. These elections will take place between an international complexity characterized by the worsening of Washington blockade against the island and its attempt to destroy the Cuban Revolution. A United States Navy admiral says the Trinidad and Tobago government is concerned about the number of its nationals who have gone to fight alongside members of the terrorist group ISIS in recent years. Kurt Tidd addressed the issue earlier this week in a Pentagon briefing at which he said the U.S. Southern Command is strengthening interagency cooperation and partnerships in the region to address evolving security threats such as terrorism. He spoke specifically about Trinidad when asked about a report when asked by a reporter to indicate what evidence he had that either ISIS cells or networks were within U.S. Southern Command's areas of responsibility, which are Central America and the Caribbean and South America. Uh, I think I would just point to uh, a couple of the um, uh, foreign fighters that have, uh, have been very vocal in the past, uh, speaking in English language uh, in, the, uh, in the ISIS fight in Syria. Uh, uh, that uh, originated in Trinidad and Tobago. We know they came. We know that uh, uh, the government of Trinidad has spoken of, uh, of 100 or so that uh, foreign fighters that have gone to, uh, to, uh, to that particular fight. So that's, I, I guess that would be the, probably the best indicator that, that yes, in fact, there are, there are individuals who have been, been radicalized, uh, who this, uh, this pernicious method or message is, uh, uh, has, uh, has, has taken root. And so it's one that's uh, of concern to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. They've, they have uh, focused on it. And so I think it's, uh, it's an area that we all have to take into consideration. Still in Port of Spain, the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago, LAT, plans to appeal Tuesday's High Court ruling that it has no power to investigate allegations of misconduct against Chief Justice Ivor Archie. In handing down her 19-page ruling, Justice Anadia Kangaloo said LAT acted outside its legal authority in beginning and continuing its inquiry into claims that Archie tried to persuade judges to change their state-provided security to a private company, which would have benefited his friend. The judge also ruled that the Law Association must pay costs to the Chief Justice in the matter. But in an email to members late Tuesday night, LAC said the council met and decided to immediately lodge an appeal and an application for an urgent hearing. It said it had been advised to postpone its special general meeting carded for next Thursday, in which a report on the investigation conducted by a subcommittee of council and advice on it from Queen's Councils Dr. Francis Alexis of Grenada and Demon Courtney of Brazil were expected to be presented for consideration but it says the council has not yet made a decision on that since it's hoping the court of appeal will hear the appeal before that date a new police commissioner for jamaica that story and more after the break stay with us
Hello, I'm Allison Seymour. Welcome to The Color of STEM. Here at The Color of STEM, we realize that there is a crucial need to increase public awareness of the importance of science and engineering, particularly in the minority community. We have to begin to celebrate STEM careers and STEM stars the same way we celebrate Hollywood celebrities, professional athletes, and entertainers. That's what we do. My only intimidation when I arrived was the people that we had to service. In those days, your head is spinning, you're dealing with people, but not one-on-one -on -one as you would like, but people are all around you. So I was wondering in those days whether I would be able to handle that, really. But then over time, it became very easy for me to do. I love to deal with people, whether they're children, whether they're adults. You know, I just love to deal with people. We continue in Jamaica where the Police Service Commission has announced the appointment of Major General Anthony Anderson as the new Commissioner of Police. His appointment will take effect on March 19th. He replaces George Quello, who resigned in January. Anderson currently serves as the National Security Advisor and is the first person to serve in that capacity in Jamaica. A statement from the Police Service Commission said Anderson has the ability to lead the Jamaica Constabulary Force at an important point of transformation and strengthen relationships with the other bodies that make up the country's security architecture. He will be the third military officer to head the Jamaica Constabulary Force in the last three decades. The first was Colonel Trevor McMillan, who was appointed in 1993, followed by Rear Admiral Hardley Lewin in 2007. The Mexican government has offered to help Jamaica stem the transshipment of guns and ammunition. Mexican Foreign Secretary Dr. Luis Vidigueri made the announcement following bilateral talks with key government ministers and Prime Minister Andrew Holness. The Mexican official said security is a major concern for both countries whose high crime rates are driven by cross-border transfers of guns and ammunition. He says Jamaica's Foreign Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith has already submitted a protocol outlining the details of the call operations surrounding the initiative to reduce cross-border shipment of guns and ammunition. One of the reasons why fighting crime is so difficult, so painful, so costly is because international crime organizations and gangs uh, have, lots of, uh, have lots of weapons. And just as what happens in Jamaica, it happens in Mexico. The weapons come from the world, come, come from elsewhere. And we need to stop that flow. The security challenge that is a very clear priority of the Jamaican uh, government is something that is also a priority for us. And uh, we are uh, prepared to do uh, technical assistance. Still in Jamaica, Prime Minister Andrew Holness has underscored the importance of dealing with hunger in Latin America and the Caribbean. He says it could undermine their ability to achieve sustained growth and development if not addressed. Holness was speaking at the opening of the 35th United Nations Food and Agriculture Conference being held in Jamaica. CMC's Kenton Chance is at the conference and has this report. The 35th United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization Conference for Latin America and the Caribbean opened in Jamaica on Wednesday at a time when hunger is on the rise in the region. Host to Prime Minister Andrew Holness told delegates that the region cannot achieve sustained growth and development with this troubling trend. Within this context, as well as the realities of climate change impacting food production and increasing the region's vulnerability, high energy costs, increasing food import bills, among others. We are at a critical juncture that requires the time to plan, address the challenges, and identify solutions that will help to secure food for generations to come. The four-day conference is focused on the issues of hunger and malnutrition, rural development, climate resilience, and sustainable agriculture. Holness identified the three areas of action that are critical as Latin America and the Caribbean seek to address these issues, the first of which is energy security. The Prime Minister said that the second critical issue is that the agricultural sector must embrace technology. The third action is promoting partnerships to maximize food production. As we seek to modernize our food production processes to address hunger and malnutrition, to promote rural development, and to be climate resilient for greater and lasting impact, 
The power of partnerships is a necessity. Tourism is a significant industry for many of our economies. And we need to improve the linkages with this industry and others. Prime Minister Holness was frontal about the realities of food security in Latin America and the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, we are at a crossroads in terms of food security. But the final destination has not yet been decided. We have the opportunity, indeed the duty, to ensure we reverse this emerging trend of rising hunger in our region that we reverse this trend of obesity and non-communicable diseases. Holness said that the region must also promote rural development to stem rural poverty, unemployment, and gender imbalances. He also called on stakeholders to integrate climate-smart solutions in food-related policies and programs. Kenton Chance, CMC News, Montego Bay, Jamaica. Critics of the petroleum agreement that Guyana has with oil giant ExxonMobil have found themselves on the receiving end of criticism. Business Minister Dominic Gaskin has hit back at them, insisting that the contract will bring in way more money than gold would annually. We get more in this report from Ryden Jones of HGP Nightly News. The continues to be heavily criticized for the contract it signed with ExxonMobil. Business Minister Dominic Gaskin had his say on Tuesday when he addressed the private sector organized oil and gas seminar. Here in Guyana, we have been thrown into the spotlight and there's suddenly a huge interest in our country by a number of major international companies. And instead of being excited about this and trying to get prepared for the opportunities that it could create, as how we are doing today, some of us are shouting and screaming every single day from the front pages of our newspapers about what a terrible thing this is and how we're getting ripped off and we're being tied up like iguanas and all sorts of foolishness, including in complete comparisons with royalties that other countries are getting. Minister Gaskin said not too much attention has been placed on what continues to be said daily since some of the statements are inaccurate and misleading. Now, as far as the contract is concerned, the fact that a handful of people have been repeating on a daily basis that this contract is bad for Guyana and that we're getting chicken feed does not make their statements true. The government of Guyana will receive, in the first year of oil production, 2% of the gross proceeds, as well as 50% of profit oil. Based on production of 100,000 barrels per day, and at today's gold price of approximately $60 per barrel, this amounts to in excess of 300 million US dollars in government revenues in the first year. I don't think that's chicken feed. Gaskin explained that the oil industry is a new one for Guyana, one in which Guyana has no real expertise, and therefore he explained that the expertise of companies like ExxonMobil is welcome. Gaskin said that oil revenues will surpass that of gold by far, and gold, over the years, has made a name for sustaining the country's economy. And ahead in Newsline's fourth, a dramatic win for West Indies A in the opening one day of the three-match series against England Lions. Stay with us. Sport is next. Don't miss this episode of Caribbean Passport as we take a closer look at the tourism sector. Grenada, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago are re-energizing their markets. We also get an insight from one of the most respected authorities in Caribbean tourism, the Honorable Alan Chastening. All this and more coming up on this channel. This is the plaintiff, Jamie Williams. She's suing her boyfriend for babysitting services after his baby mama dropped the kid off with her for three days. She seeks reimbursement for a plane ticket because she had to miss her grandma's 90th birthday party. She's suing for $450. This is the defendant, Tyrell Johnson. He says he didn't know his child was left at her house. 
And since they're a couple, how's she gonna sue him for looking after his seed? International recording artist I Octane has revealed the cover of his third full-length album titled Love and Life. Produced under his own production company, Conquer the Globe Productions, the long-awaited album features 17 tracks with the addition of two bonus when you pre-order the album. Love and Life offers just that, songs that relate to everyday situations from the infectious love ballad Let Me Love You to the cheeky hit single Pretty Loud. Part-time off-spinner Rustin Chase had century maker Sam Hain caught in the deep with three balls left as West Indies A snatched a dramatic five-run victory in the opening day-night one day of the three-match series against England Lions on Tuesday night. Windy's A rallied to 272 all-out with a ball remaining after opting to bat first. Test star Jermaine Blackwood had fallen short of 100 with 99 while Cornwall made 44 and Andre McCarthy 33. Chasing a competitive 273 at College Cricket Ground in Antigua the debutant Hain struck a brilliant 144 to rescue Lions after their innings lay in shambles at 165 for 9 in the 34th over. Slumping at 128 for 8 in the 26th over, Lions were spared embarrassment by Hain, who put on 37 with Gleason for the ninth wicket before producing a valiant last wicket effort with Parkinson. The visitors were undone by 20-year-old seamer Kimo Paul, who just missed out on a hat-trick as he finished with 5 for 49, while off-spinner Rakeem Cornwall claimed 2 for 38. Rookie West Indies batsman Shimron Hetmeyer was understandably thrilled after notching his maiden one-day international hundred, but said it was batting with superstar Chris Gale that had fulfilled one of his childhood dreams. The 21-year-old Hetmeyer top scored with 127, while fellow left-hander Gale plummelled 123 as West Indies notched their fourth highest ODI score of 357 for four en route to beating Minos United Arab Emirates by 60 runs in their opening match of the ICC World Cup qualifiers on Tuesday. The pair added 103 for the second wicket, a partnership Hetmeyer said he had dreamed of as a young boy growing up in Guyana. Uh, it was fun, a fantastic feeling for me. Uh, I grew, grew, grew up from the age, from the age, from the tender age of probably five and even, even younger, watching Chris on television and trying to, uh, thinking of the day of when I will be, I will be accompanying him at the crease as well and even being with being there when he got when he got his hundred, it was just fantastic. Hetmeyer arrived at the crease after Gale and Evan Lewis had posted 88 for the first wicket and blossomed after a patient start to strike 14 fours and four sixes in an entertaining 96 ball knock. He said he had taken a simple approach to his innings, especially with focusing on hitting the ball straighter. As I said earlier, I just went out to accompany Chris and just tried to rotate the strike as much as possible to him. And at the same time, tried to get myself in. And I guess that worked for me well. That worked well for me today. I'm just working on it as as of as of late. I'm working on hitting the ball as straight as I possibly can and not trying to go across it. And I guess it worked for me today. I just keep trying, keep working on it in the nets and getting it, getting it as perfect as possible. And captain Jason Holder heaped praises on his side for their performance. He singled out veteran batsman Chris Gale for being true to form on the pitch and Shimran Hetmeyer for showing maturity at the crease. Yeah, extremely pleased with the way the, the, way the guys played. Um, obviously Chris was outstanding and you know, he really set the tone for us. You know, and I think the beauty about the way Chris played is that the other guys came in and supported him. You know, he was going great guns blazing and a guy like Evan Lewis who was normally quite fluent as well you know, was able to support him and just gave him the strike. Um, I think Shemar Hetmeyer was outstanding as well as his maiden ODI century. Um, you know, he really supported Chris up front and then you know, when Chris left you know, he was the guy to take over the mantle you know, and he was outstanding in doing that and showed a lot of maturity for a very young player. The captain also gave himself a pat on the back for his five-wicket haul in the match. He said conditions at the old Hararian were quite conducive for Siemens. I was pleased with the ball in up front and I got a bit of bounce and a bit of seam, so I just tried to use that to my advantage. Um, I think Kimar started well and, as well as Sheldon before he got injured. And, um, it was one of those wickets where um, the ball did carry through and, and it had a bit of seam moment up front. So, you know, it's, it's just about putting ball in the right areas, but as you said, you know, credit to the UAE bats, batters. I thought they played really well and, you know, they pushed us in the very end, and, but I think two, 350 runs was too much for them. 
Holder also renewed calls for his men to be consistent as they prepare to meet Papua New Guinea on Thursday. You know, we're playing every game as a final, as I, as I said from the very beginning, you know. We've, we've seen the up, a few of the opposition so far and, and everybody has a point to prove, you know. Everybody wants to qualify for the World Cup. It's a big occasion, so we would expect PNG to come, you know, firing at us and, and to give us another push, you know. But it's up to us to be consistent and, and to be disciplined. I think once we're consistent and disciplined, then um, the results will take care of themselves, you know. Um, but credit to the guys players and I'm, and I'm pleased with, with the effort. Switching sport now, deposed CONCACAF football boss and FIFA Vice President Jeffrey Webb may have to wait a little while longer to know his feet on corruption charges. And that's because a U.S. federal court judge for the seventh time granted a request by Webb's attorneys to delay the sentence in hearing. The comedian was expected to be sentenced on Wednesday. He has admitted to racketeering conspiracy, three counts of wire fraud conspiracy, and three counts of money laundering conspiracy when he was at the helm of the hemispheric football body and at FIFA. Webb, who was at one point tipped to become FIFA president, was one of several high-profile football officials arrested during a pre-dawn raid in Zurich in May 2015 as FIFA staged this annual meeting. He was subsequently included in a 47-count indictment announced by the U.S. Department of Justice with Trinidadian Jack Warner, a former CONCACAF chief and powerful FIFA vice president, also named. Webb's for sentencing is now scheduled for September 7th. And that's the spot. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Barbados, renowned for its pristine beachfront and fantastic weather, continues to leave quite an impression on newcomers to the island and returning visitors. The Caribbean Island. Quite popular as a vacation hotspot is not only beautiful due to its natural aesthetics. The island of Barbados continues to grow in popularity because of unique connections developed with our people, our culture. We can't wait to welcome you. Again, the major developments of this day, Antigua and Barbuda's Electoral Commission questions the court's authority to decide on where Barbudans vote in upcoming general elections. And in sport, West Indies A snatched a dramatic five-run victory in the opening day-night one day of the three-match series against England Lions. That's Caribbean News Time. For news and sport around the clock, log on to carnanews.com. We'll be here again tomorrow. But from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching and do have yourselves a good night.